uh, let's start. Uh, any questions about the homework, the new homework? That's the last homework for you in this class, which is good. And uh, it's not super hard, but it's very exciting because it asks you to really start a real process, like a piece of user code, which essentially allows you to to just like build your own operating system as a next step. So as an extra credit we ask, we allow you to implement, uh, load, load multiple processes and, uh, and implement context switching, which is very easy with the setup which, provide, which we provide. Uh, so good, everyone is good with this? Okay, so then uh, let's quickly go back to what we were doing uh, last time. And uh, uh, today our plan is the following. We're gonna finish uh, synchronization. So understand one specific problem about uh, how, like a couple of specific problems uh, related to synchronization. And then we start a new lecture on a file system, right? So it's it's the last piece which we didn't cover in this uh, in this class. So file system systems are also important. So just a quick reminder. So this is what we were doing last time. So remember, we wanted to implement uh, a synchronization primitive, which allows us to effectively execute uh, uh, pieces of code atomically, meaning that uh, no other core will interrupt execution of uh, a sequence of instructions, right? And specifically, we wanted it because we said, okay, look, uh, we have a linked list data structure, and that's just one example, but you will see a lot more, uh, which needs to operate on, on multiple pieces of global data. And if you essentially allow multiple core to cores to perform those operations concurrently, you will end up in an inconsistent state. And so what we were doing, we were building this primitive, which is a spin lock, uh, which allows us to say, look, uh, only one thread of execution, uh, be it on one core or be it on multiple cores, can execute these lines uh, at a time, right? And so if I ask you a question, so what it, like, I, I did explain, uh, what, what does it mean when two cores execute the same uh, two lines at about the same time, right? So I'm saying like, look, the cache line is really, will be just bounced between these two cores, right? That's what we were talking about last time. But uh, uh, who can tell me what does it mean when two threads T1 and T2 are running on the same core? Meaning that uh, obviously one of them is running first T1 uh, and then maybe T2 can start running next. Uh, so what can go wrong in this setup? Even on a single core system, you will need this uh, spin lock. Why? Who can tell me? Oh, why here we care about the cache line? Why do we care about the cache line? Uh, okay, can anyone answer the question about the cache line? What I'm still wondering about too, because I'm not sure if that's the the, uh, the cast language is or the cast language is the same. Okay, okay. No, let me let me that that's important to understand. So let's uh let's go back to this example, right? So this is our link list. There is one cache line which contains uh this piece of data, which contains the head of the list, right? This is the head. And uh, like physically, like initially it's in DRAM. So, right, the cache line sits somewhere here, right? Maybe we're, when we were booting into the system, we initialize this head to now, for example, wrote it in memory during boot, for example, and then it got evicted into memory, right? And it's nowhere around in the cache, right? When first CPU says, okay, look, I'm gonna allocate uh, this new element, which I want to add to the list, right? It will be a different cache line. So now you have two cache lines, right? So the one which contains the head, let's call it cache line one, and the cache line which contains this piece of data, right? The fact that the code, the code is sitting somewhere else as well. So like uh, your actual move instructions, which do all these operations, right? They also sit in some cache lines and uh, they are fine. There are like instructions, right? Uh, so okay, we we keep we keep going. So obviously, uh, 
the code which we are executing is literally this. So we did this malloc, right? So obviously this cache line, which uh, which contains this new element of the list uh, will be in your first level cache on a core, which accesses this element of the list, right? So our next instruction is to say, okay, look, I actually will touch the global, the head of the list. So this, this pointer points to some element, to some old element here, right? So I will touch this value because I will do this assignment, right? So let me show you here. Uh, so effectively, what we're going to do is say we, we're going to read this cache line, right? And it will have a pointer to this element, right? And we will assign this pointer to this element, which means that we write, we'll write this cache line, right? So cache line two, right? So both of these are on this CPU, right, for now. So now this CPU starts doing malloc, allocates another cache line. Like it allocates an element, but underneath the CPU says, okay, it will be in a specific cache line, right? And it says, at this point, it, it, it does about the same. It says, okay, look, I, I need to read, I need to do this assignment, right? So I need to read the cache line, which contains the head of the list. And so this cache line, which was read, read on this uh, core one, and it was, let's say, in a shared state, will be also like transferred to this core two, and will be also here in a, in a shared state, right? So it will be, I don't know, like I drew, I drew it here, maybe it's, it's wrong. So uh, you know, like wrong in a, in, in a way that I should like make sure that it's clear that this cache line, which contains the, uh, the head of the list will be on both cores, on core one and on core two, right? In a shared state, meaning that you can read it, but cannot modify it, right? Is it clear? And, and later on we say, okay, look, at this point, we start doing writes. So, and which cache line is that we're trying to write? Who can help? Can you go back to the actual code? The shared. To the actual code? Yeah, I can just show you the code real quick. Uh, it's uh, pa pa pa. Yeah. That's the actual code. Uh, let me erase everything. Have yeah. So which cache line is that? So you you're updating the cache line which contains this list variable, right? So this is the one which we agreed exist. That's the cache line, right? And it exists in a shared state here and a shared state here. So in order for this core to do something like list equals uh, this element, right? Whatever L. Right, we need to try to acquire ownership of this cache line, right? So, which means that the cache line is evicted from both cores, and no, it's not evicted from this first one. It's just upgraded to the exclusive state, right? Which means that this core can write it, right? And so, this write happens; it goes through. Maybe at about the same time, this core tries to execute about the same operation. So it tries to update the list to its own L, right? And it's a different, obviously different L, right? And it also tries to update the cache line, like trying to say, I really, I really want to write it. So it's called request for ownership, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, at some point, uh, this message, the request arrives to the cache coherence protocol to a piece of hardware which implements this cache coherence protocol and it says okay look hold on like i just gave the ownership to another core and i will try to get it get it back for you but you have to wait a little bit right and so then uh this triggers since it will be in a modified state it will be it will trigger a, a write back to memory and then this will become invalid and this will become uh exclusive on this core and this core can do the right right now it's clear Okay, so you, you understood that the cache lines are, it's it's all about the data, right? So we all we all agree on this. Okay, cool. That's important. So like, and you will you will see later in life that you have to like reason about those things, right? Okay, but uh, wait, I forgot which question I was asking. We're asking this critical stacking. Yeah. Okay. Got it. So thank you. And I think that, um, 
uh, dependency scheduler and your time and things like that. You could, within the same core, you could switch from one thread to another. And Correct. Correct. So where between which two lines the context switch have to has to happen to cause a problem? Right, exactly. Here. So between 15 and 16. So essentially one process uh does this, right? And then another, and then it, it's it's placed on hold before executing line 16. And then the other process executes all the lines on the same core. Right. And uh, like the cache line game will be a slightly different because everything will happen on a single core, but still this problem can happen. Right. I agree with this. So it's important to understand that even in, on a single core machine, if you allow context switching, this problem can happen. Right. Any questions about this? You said no. We thought. Say again? You, you said no. This problem happens with a lot and with all. No, no, without a lot. Okay. Uh, okay. So and, uh, the, the, the glue is, uh, does not exist yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, for a second. I was explaining, but I will ask you a different question slightly, uh, which your question is kind of leads to this. Mm -hmm. So remember, we talked about the spin lock and we got the implementation. We said, okay, cool. Uh, this is not working, but we are smart enough. We use this exchange instruction. Uh, and that's our correct implementation of a spin lock, right? But again, I go back to my question on a single core with a context switch, two threads, T1 and T2. Like, it seems that this implementation did not, did not eliminate the problem, right? The context switch actually can happen. They agree? So what do we have to do about it then? Right. No, actually, uh, yeah, you're right. So that 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 will, yeah, yeah. Hold on, hold on. Yeah. The, the, okay. Uh, what I meant to say is that my question should be asked the following way: How will it work on a single core with this atomic exchange? The problem will not happen, but what will happen? So if uh, if one of the threads acquires the lock and starts the critical section, right? Yeah. So it like thread one, T1, acquires the lock here, starts the critical section. And at this point, timer interrupt happens and we switch to thread two. Thread two also tries to acquire a spin lock. Will it go through? No. No, it will be, yeah, it will be wait. And it will be waiting for the entire, it's called the time slice until the next time or interrupt, or maybe even for a while, because if you have multiple threads of a, in a system, you have to go back to T1 to give it the chance to run and just move through the critical section and release the lock, right? So that's not super cute in terms of performance, right? So suddenly like uh, T2 cannot do anything and just simply spins there forever not forever, but the entire time slice, trying to acquire the lock, not doing anything, right? So that's that's not element. Uh, which leads us to, to the following observation. So maybe it also makes sense, in some cases at least, like when it makes sense, like in this example, to disable interrupts when we acquire a lock. And there is yet another reason for doing that. And I will explain it in a second. Okay, so any questions? So there was a question while I was talking about it. All good? What's the exclusive thing? There's no issue with... If the CPU was not virtualized on the single core of the CPU, would there not be an issue where it has the cache coherence in the favor? And so it's like, even though it's a different thread on the same CPU, it's like, okay, you already have it. Wait, I, you lost me. So what's the, are you trying to ask uh, if you're really running a single thread on a single core, do you even need locks? No, more like if you're running two threads on the same core. Uh-huh. 
would the court be deciding who owns the lock or would is the lock unique to the court or the court? Hold on, hold on. No, you I still don't understand. Like if someone because can refer the court, if you had threats, it would still be owning the lock. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the problem because uh, if the if the threat acquires the lock uh, and it's a global variable, right? So the spin lock is a global variable in a data section. You context switch. The second thread comes in, tries to acquire the lock, but it's already acquired. So it will be spinning here for the duration of the entire time slice for the, until the next time error interrupt. So you just wasted the time, not doing anything. Right? So it's unique to the thread. Uh, you mean you're asking the question if this list lock is unique to the thread or to the core or to? No, it's a global variable. It has to be visible to all the cores, right? So it's it's a single variable in the entire program because you have to synchronize between multiple threads of execution on multiple cores, right? And that's why the cast line is bouncing between them because they all try to access the same piece of data. Question. Um, so specifically for this business for the case, uh, my first question is um, we wouldn't have to deal with hardware level gaps in OEC anymore because those the any SI space are for code. Well, I, I that. Correct, correct. So what you're asking is that on a single core machine, uh, what happens to the cache coherence protocol? Uh, so I think there are really two, uh, like if you really like design an embedded CPU, which you say it's like, we'll, be, we'll have one single physical core, yeah. you can just keep cache coherence altogether. The hardware will not have it at all. When you say, look, I, I have an Intel machine and I somehow booted my operating system and in such a manner that it just initialized one core. The cache coherence is running underneath because I don't think BIOS will allow you to disable cache coherence altogether. I mean, there might be an option to do that, but I don't think it's exposed to us as users, right? So the silicon will be running still, but it will be just like, it almost like an all of this experience. I mean, good question. So let me explain. Uh, I mean, I. I'm a little I'm a little bit uh, surprised, but uh, but uh, let's let, let's go through it again. Uh, okay, it's I mean, in this this year we're not going to build threads, right? But uh, in previous years we occasionally had a homework assignment which asked you to extend X with six with threads. I'll ask you a question: What is the thread? What is like if like okay? We kind of like in our homework, we're building a minimal operating system, right? So we, we already know how to support interrupts. Next week, we're going to know how to load uh, by Tuesday, hopefully. We'll know how to load a uh, user code, how to implement a syscall, and almost how to build scheduler, right? So I up until now, what I was always saying is that the process is essentially, and we remember the process data structure. We said, okay, the process data structure is a, uh, is a piece of, uh, it's a simple data structure in kernel, which describes the address space of the process, right? So if you have a proc data structure uh, and you say it has a pointer to a page table uh, and this, again, this is a page table. Somehow like my, my, my drawing today is even worse than usual. So it's an address space, right? And if I ask you, okay, but what is the process? It also has a collection of registers we also have, uh, we said, okay, there is like a, a pointer, which we call the context, the pointer to the context. And uh, I'm not sure what's something is broken with my pen, but essentially it's a collection of registers, right? And, uh, and, and, and that kind of represents the thread of execution. So instruction pointer in user space, which executes some instructions, right? If I ask you a question, okay, so how can you extend this construct with support for threads? Threads are essentially very much like processes, but they share the address space. 
So what's the simplest extension to XV6 to implement threads? Kind of, right. So in a, in a homework, which we used to assign, we literally just reuse the prog data structure, mm -hmm. but you're right. So you can just simply implement multiple contexts, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's about equivalent. So, and okay, you say, look, there is another process data, data structure. And the reason we reuse the process data structure because it's easier to uh, integrate with x scheduler, which reasons about processes, right? So mm -hmm. otherwise you have to explain what to schedule next, right? Mm -hmm. But at a, at a high level, it can, it, can be, it can point to the same page table, right? Because they share the address space and maybe have a different context, right? Not maybe, but for real, right? And then you have uh, kind of like an instruction pointer, which points to the same instruction stream here in this address space. So this instruction pointer, EIP1, I don't know, like, usually I'm way better with writing, but today the hardware fails me, hand fails me. Uh, let me try again. Uh, so you have... Uh, EAP of this thread pointing to like some instruction in an EAP of this thread, which points to some instruction. And you say, look, but uh, this instruction pointer, if it's, if if we have a, a machine with a single CPU, they never execute at the same time. They just take turns, right? If we have a machine with multiple physical CPUs, you actually can run on two different, different physical cores so you can load those contexts onto different physical CPUs and run them at about the same time, right? Uh, but you share the address space, which means that this variable list log is sits in your data section. And of course, I keep saying that it sits in, in a specific cache line, which will be bouncing between these two cores if someone wants to access them, right? In a single core, it will be this, like it's the same cache line in, in even well, like okay, like it's yeah, it will be a single core. It will be a single cast line in in a single core core scenario, right? And and can you again remind me what you were asking? I'm trying to explain the global picture of how it works, but uh, yeah. yeah. So I think the point, and but when you have two threads on the same phone, when they check the log. They will see the same state of the world. Correct. And that's the whole point, right? And even in, in, in case of multiple CPUs, they will see the same state because this cast line, the rot, if, if this core rolled into it, it did the update to the cast line. This most recent write will be visible to the other core when it will try to read it or write it, right? A lock acquired by one In theory, it can. Wait. But, but yeah, correct. Right, right, right. Okay, very good observation. So what you're saying is that it's kind of like uh, my my perpetual speech about the stack. I'm saying stack is nothing magical. It's just a convention, right? So if you really like, if you're really, really annoyed with what the runtime of the language is doing, you can change the stack and then maybe you will run for some time. Maybe you will actually do something smart or maybe faster, right? So it's the same here. You can acquire a lock on one thread and release it on another. But it typically means that you have a bug in your program, mm -hmm. unless you are very, very clever and implement a new synchronization primitive, which specifically does it, right? But it's the same cache line, you can write it. So locks are kind of like a convention, which allows you to implement some sanity between like between threads. But if you if you know what you're doing and you say like, hey, I'll do an insane thing, but it really makes sense. And I have a mathematical proof about why it makes sense or like proof on paper, then you do it, right? But you cannot lock. That's important to understand that it's just the hardware underneath is very, very like it's blind. It will do whatever you want. You want to write into this line, you will write into this line. And this is the reason for bugs and like complex systems, like operating system kernels. For example, someone acquires the lock and someone reinitializes the same lock again accidentally and it like goes to zero again. Or for example, you acquire a lock and someone releases the object because it's a uh, Somehow you made a bug and you set free, and the free, for example, sets everything to zero because the memory uh, manager maybe like reinitializes memory to zero or something like that. And then it's very hard to debug off. Yeah. So in the single case, we're and would it like? You mean? 
Yeah, so what you're really asking is that uh, do you really do have to do a write back, right? Yeah, yeah. No. Right. And, and on a single core, the write back will not even happen because the cache coherence doesn't know anything about the context switch. You just, for cache coherence, it looks like an instruction pointer was pointing to instruction A. You enter the kernel, you switch it to point to point B, but whatever, it's still. At the level of hardware, nothing happens, so it doesn't it doesn't know anything about the threads, right? So uh, and stuff like that. So and it will not. It will say, "Oh, okay, it's a, it's in the writable state." So go ahead, write again. Like I I will own it at, at, at this core, right? Okay, good. Uh, any other questions about this example? Good. Okay, so let me move on. So, but okay. So what I really, I was trying to set a stage. First of all, I, I was trying to make sure that we all remember what's going on. But uh, I wanted to, to kind of like talk about a couple of corner cases where we still have to improve this implementation of this law. So the current corner case number one, imagine uh, we, imagine, imagine walk on tablet never, Never fails, uh, but uh, well, I know how to quickly restart it. Uh, what now, works. People, I apologize for that. Where is my white deck? So imagine you have uh, multiple CPUs, right? Imagine we have uh, some piece of code which uh, first acquires A, right? Then uh, right about the same time, another piece of code, slightly maybe same program, same two different threads of the same program. This core acquires log B, right? So it just happens. But maybe for, for whatever reason, like a logic of your code, you have to acquire multiple logs because maybe Maybe there are like multiple objects in your address space and you say, I want to update two of them. So you say, look, I have to update object A and object B. Maybe it's a graph or some kind of a data structure which like links them together. And then this, this the first core tries to actually acquire B, right? But B is already acquired. And so this one will be waiting on B, right? And the other piece of code somehow sees this data structure. So this is thread one. It first acquires A, then acquires B, and the thread two like somehow goes in an opposite order. So it says, okay, I've first acquired B, and I will try to acquire A, right? Just because I was going into this data structure from a different direction, and it will be waiting uh, on this lock, right? And at this point, uh, like the whole thing stops, right? This spinning will last forever, right? It's called a deadlock, right? Do you agree with this? Because yeah. you said, okay, look, it just didn't, didn't like, uh, like we will be waiting on those lines forever. So what's the key observation here? How can you avoid this problem? Don't use, Don't use the locks. Yeah. Say again. Don't what? Well, okay, that's 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 a that's a meaningful design choice. But imagine you have a, a graph. Like literally, you're not doing operating system, or operating system has a graph in a kernel. It happened. I've seen it. It it's rare. And you say, look, I want to update the, the semantics of my operation requires update of multiple pointers, right? Well, or multiple nodes in a graph, right? So you have to. I mean, one design choice, have a single giant log, log for the entire graph, right? Mm -hmm. That works. It doesn't play well with uh, multiple CPUs because only one core can, up, can update the graph at a time. And if, even if another core tries to update a completely different subset of nodes, it will still have to wait for the first log, right? So it's, it's called a big log. And Linux kernel was actually written in such a manner that it was using a big log. But then when you scale to 16 or 32 CPUs, it means that other everything, everything else has to wait for this first thread. So it's not a good design choice, right? And I don't know how, how well it's explained in other classes. So algorithms, databases, uh, log-free data structure, stuff like that. So 
in a modern world, you have to design software which tries to use fine grain loops. In most cases, it makes sense, right? So, and the reason is concrete, like exactly this. So if you don't, if your updates don't really overlap on the data set, you can perform them in parallel, right? And scale with the number of cores, right? So while this approach works and it's used in practice using just one single log, it might not work always, right? So what is the other approach? No, hold on, like, but how do you even know, like, whether you're like the whole point of knowing that someone acquired a loan right. is to acquire a loan, right? To yeah. kind of advertise this message saying, okay, I, 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 I did acquire a lock, right? So it's like uh, it's specifically for the draft to work. To, um, I'm guessing you're locking from node to node as you're trying to do it. So you sort of before yeah okay you're saying release the first one before acquiring the second one got it so it's a meaningful design choice but not always works right because what if your semantics of your operation requires atomic update of all three for example right and we will see in the file systems when where the when these atomic updates are needed right so literally if you update one data structure but not the other the view of the system is inconsistent. Yeah, yeah. Right. So you really need to update them all at once. Then the other process, or, or if what about logs for time loops that you only wait for so long and if it's not working when you go to the Ryan Stutzman teaches operating system or uh, distributed systems. They use logs with timeouts. It's called leases. Uh, Protocols get complicated, but feasible, but doesn't solve this problem. But uh, no, you're right. So may solve this problem, but tricky, tricky business. So let's come with a simpler solution. Another practical strategy. Uh, yeah, you can do that as well, but uh, you might, uh, like if you do those iterations, Totally, it may it will it may work eventually, but maybe not the optimal strategy. So because what if like you you kind of in a grid loop can do the same pattern over and over. So eventually it might go through, but if this chain of this lock is long, the probability of it going through is lower and lower, right? So not ideal. But solution is really simple. I'm surprised actually that you guys don't know it. Correct. So what you're trying to say, let's use a big log to quickly acquire some logs uh, and uh, and hopefully, and, you know, and hopefully it will optimize the wait time for, for other threats. And that's correct, but it still kind of hurts your scalability because in practice, logs are, the critical sections are so short, or at least you can almost always design them to be short. Like in this linked list, it's literally two instructions. So acquiring the local will take you longer than executing this, these instructions, right? Mm -hmm. You have. We could have also add to do focus focus on tracking whether we have this cycle. If we have this cycle, we can do something like uh, right uh, uh, assign some priority to say yeah, some low priority need to give up the log. Some higher priority, then can continue. Mm, probably possible, but really, like a very simple solution, like a kind of like natural solution, which anyone has to implement. Okay, let me reveal it. Reveal it. So we will always be acquiring lock in locks in the same order. I mean, when you write the code, you say, "Look, maybe I have uh, lock A, and then I have lock B. I will always acquire A before B." Right. Sometimes it's possible to to check this statically. Like first acquire the log for the file system, and then for the disk driver, for example. Right. But sometimes, like in in the example of my dynamic data structure, which is a graph, for example, you don't upfront know uh, like like what is the order, right? And literally, the approach here is to say, look, I need to acquire logs for these three objects. I will sort them. 
we introduce ordering on them. So essentially a simple sort can be like a value of the pointer, like literally the actual value, 32 bit value. And you say like pointer one, pointer two, pointer three. We say, okay, this is the set which we try to update. We don't do anything to the set, but we just sort it and make sure that, you know, like P3 comes before P1 and then P2. And everyone who like ever acquires even a different set of uh, locks will also follow the same order, right? So and that's, that's one way to do it, right? So acquire locks in order. Well, smart people started thinking, okay, does it work? Okay, I'm not gonna not gonna spend the time proving it. So go 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 do the algorithms class. But it's not super often in practice. So most likely what everything what you're gonna be coding will end up with just like static reasoning about the order of actual locks, like file, like by subsystem, kind of like maybe this is a syscall lock. Like we're gonna see in a second those two locks in, in X with six, for example, right? Uh, so it's easy. So dynamic sorting is rare, but that's that's the answer, right? So always acquire locks in order, right? We got it. So that's rule number one. So so you mean this is the stat static uh, technology of dynamic time? Second, no, like this is a static case where you say I, my set of locks is statically known at development time. So as a developer, I know that I always have to acquire a uh, before does B. any compiler support this feature. I'm pretty sure it's not hard for a compiler to check, like develop a static analysis to, to check that to a, That's like there is, be. yeah, pretty sure. Look, look, it, there's a ton of paper on like on checking for lock uh, disciplines. But this dynamic, you have to like, really, if you have a graph and you have to acquire elements of this graph in order, then you have to do the sorting. Okay, there's another problem with locks. Locks and interrupts. It uh, never happens at user level because, I mean, maybe happens, but you never get a, uh, never get a preempted, right? So in this example, I have a single lock, A, just very simple example. Maybe you're receiving a network packet from the, you receive a network interrupt, your network device driver says, okay, I got a new packet on the network. I will allocate a new uh, element on the list, similar to how we like maintain our list data structure. I acquire a lock and suddenly, boom, another interrupt happens. Same network packet maybe. And uh, so, and you follow the same logic and you say, look, I, I need to acquire a lock to insert this element into the uh, packet list. And obviously you're gonna be waiting on a previous acquisition of already acquired lock, right? On a, on a, on a previous acquired mm -hmm. lock, right? Do you see the problem? So how do we approach this problem? How to solve it? Lock ordering will not help. It's one lock, just a disable. Disable what? Mm -hmm. oh. Disable interrupts, right? Exactly. So the discipline which operating system implements is that you never hold the lock with interrupts enabled, right? So you first disable interrupts to prevent this case because, like, who knows? Like, what about you acquire the lock and immediately interrupts comes in, right? So, and the infrastructure for this is the following. So inside the acquire, you will Disable interrupts. I will, it's remember that the CLI is a, clear. yeah, it's an instruction which clears the flag in the E flags register, right? Unfortunately, and, and this is what's happened here, you're disabling interrupts. Unfortunately, obviously, you cannot just simply disable interrupts here. You cannot just simply write CLI here. Why? Who can tell me? You have uh, two, Locks in different areas, and one process goes into one lock, and while the other process goes into a different lock. The yeah. first process quickly exits, and now interrupts are being enabled in that second. Correct. So, what you're saying is that you might have nested, either nested acquisitions of the locks in a single thread, and then the first re enabling, re enable the interrupts for everything. So, you have to actually implement this nesting. So, mm -hmm. this push CLI implements kind of like a, a counter, which says, I will remember how many times I dis I, I disabled the interrupts and only re-enable them at the very like outmost level, right? So essentially push CLI just counts how many times interrupts were disabled. So the very first time it, it executes CLI says, well, uh, it increments the counter and it will be doing that. And the pop CLI will essentially 
will do the same. It will decrement the counter, but uh, uh, pop, pop, pop. like it will re-enable the interrupts only when you SF, only when you like uh, when you reach zero effectively, right? Mm -hmm. So that that kind of logic also nesting of locks, right? So and these are essentially two important things which we need to remember about uh, about uh, implementing acquire and release, right? In the operating system kernel, in user level code, obviously, will you will never be able, you will never be disabling interrupts just because there is no such thing as an interrupt handler. Although there are signals, right? So you have to be a little bit careful. Okay, cool. So there is one last thing which we have to discuss. Like uh, we have to discuss how those locks work with inter-process communication. And an example of inter-process communication is the pipe, right? So I'll simplify the example a little bit. Let's imagine we have a single uh, send receive queue. So it's, uh, it's a communication mechanism which sends uh, a single pointer to an object, some object here on, on a heap, for example, between two threads, right? And the way we send is that we say, look, I will, like, you have two methods, right? And the send method specifically says, okay, I will take a new pointer, which the user provides, right? Oh, no, I will take a pointer to the queue, and I will take a new pointer, which, which has to be sent. And I will check if the queue is empty, like, and this is a very simple queue. It has only one element, right? So it says, if this element is empty, then everything is fine. I will just assign a pointer and the send completes, right? If it's not empty, it means that the previous send hasn't yet uh, finished, right? So I will be spinning here, waiting for the previous send to complete, right? And the send completes when someone someone actually receives, receives something from a queue, right? And so uh, the receive method works like this. It takes a pointer to the queue. It will return a pointer to the object which was passed in the queue, right? And specifically, uh, what you do here is that you check, okay, if the pointer is empty, I will keep sp spinning until the message arrives. When the message arrives, uh, I will reset the pointer to zero and re return the pointer, which I read here, right? Does it make sense? So it's like, you're running two threads. Uh, maybe it's uh, like on two different CPUs or even on one, on, on one CPU, right? So agree, we understand how it works? Yeah. Just to wake up everyone, let's quickly do a poll. Yay. Polls are important for people who are online and for people who are in class but sleeping. And I only need to make sure that the poll loads and it does not, man. Really? Okay, got it. Let me enable it. Okay, so the poll asks you the following question. It asks, uh, uh, is everything good with this queue? Does it work if you're sending between like two different cores, for example, two threads running on two different cores, or even on one core? Question? Um, how likely is it that after the first load on the receive function, it will continue to be What do you mean? So, like, that's probably like, a good question, but just explain what you mean. So, while P equals Q pointer, mm -hmm. um, this would be a load instruction that will load Q pointer from the uh -huh. into the one. And as the while loop continues, but it keeps checking that value in the loop and it will put it down in the loop. I'm giving the network in the box. Yeah, the only network is cache coherence, right? Yeah. So, but let me explain maybe. So, again, so, and uh, like, I'm mildly confused about what's going on with those protocols every time I look at them, and you really happen to be an expert to understand. But uh, if there is a cache line, right, which represents uh, this QPTR, right, the moment we roll something here, the value shows up here as P, right, and uh, you keep fetching this cache line, saying, "Okay, I wanna, I wanna read it, I wanna read it," like, and you keep reading it, and there is nothing here for a while, right? Yeah. When you do this right, 
this instruction says, okay, I want this cache line. I will request ownership of this cache line. And this request will go through sooner or later. So this cache becomes invalid on this core. It goes here, this cache line to this core in the exclusive state. This guy cannot, obviously the next iteration of, of the loop cannot complete because the cache line is in invalid state, but it sends a request to cache coherence protocol saying, like, give me this cache line. I really want to read it. Uh, for a while, it's blocked by this core because this write completes. So essentially, writes P here. Exclusive gets like triggers a write back. Eventually, goes here, right? And here it becomes in the probably shared or invalid state, depending on the protocol, right? And this you will see P, right? So you will definitely see this once, right? And the code seems to be correct because if the, even if the next send arrives immediately this queue is not empty, right? So it will be spinning here, right? So what does it tell us about this implementation? Let's take quickly take a look at the at, uh, at the poll. So what do people think about it? Uh, where's the poll here again? Uh, so how do we do this? Every time I'm confused about it. So, okay, so people say, there's a, there's a like roughly with roughly split, split in half. So people say there is a possibility of a deadlock. Uh, receiver never exits the while loop even after the sender sends something. And there is second half of the people who says it will work, but wastes a lot of TPU cycles if communication is rare. So anyone cares to explore, explain their choice? So whichever you took, I don't have. Um, I think the first one doesn't happen based on the realms of the loop. If the uh, validation works, then the receiver will Correct. Yeah, I believe so too. For the communication point, like most listening, listener programs do run the loop. Right? Yeah. Okay, so you also had a version of it? Uh, uh, disclosure, I chose the bottom. Uh -huh. But uh, an argument to the top one is depending on the compiler flags, uh, the assembly could just be a single check to make sure that that uh, is the valid, like for a standard, for example, and see how it says well and keep going in and not okay. go up. Depending on how it's compiled, uh, it could just check three point oh once. Wait, wait, hold on. Why? 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 Not? Okay, okay, hold on. So, uh, first of all, like compiler should faithfully implement the the C code, right? So the only thing uh, you say, the only way to optimize this line to so checking once or not checking at all is to somehow make the conclusion that this pointer cannot be changed anywhere in a program, right? And so it can happen, and maybe like you need to add something like a volatile flag here to tell the compiler, okay, this pointer can randomly change at any point in time, right? right? But uh, besides those details, the compiler should really implement this loop. So you, you, you will see uh, this case where volatile is important, right? So, but typically not. Is that what you meant? Yeah. So that's Okay, yeah, so maybe maybe I'm missing a volatile here. So I forgot where I took this example from, maybe from the book, maybe myself. So volatile mild, might, might be important, right? But other than that, do we agree that the protocol works, right? Seems to work. There is no deadlock. So my point, my second point, volatile. Volatile is a C flag, which tells that the variable can change underneath at any time, meaning that there is no flow in your program, which... There is no right to this variable, but it can still change either by the hardware or by another core. Uh, you should, uh, I mean, like uh, the game. So John Regeer, uh, our wonderful professor here, he has, he was an expert on volatiles at some point. And he was actually uh, probably one of the first people who pioneered the work on compiler testing, meaning that compilers actually did not implement the volatile directive correctly, right? So he was testing real GCC and LLVM compilers for that, right? Along with another professor, Eric Heidi here. 
So the point is that uh, the volatile di directive in the C standard tells you that, uh, tells the compiler that the variable can be changed externally and should not be optimized out. So, and I'm, my understanding of this, I understand it like that, but maybe there are more corner cases and you have to like so, really- So this means that the program should not put this in cache? No, it will be in cache. In fact, the caching discipline doesn't change, but the program, like if you roughly speaking, if you if you say, look, uh, like do I really need this while loop? Because if uh, the pointer cannot change, then maybe I can check it once and just go forward, right? So compiler might make this optimization. So maybe I'm not right here, but like there are there are cases when the compiler sees that the, the variable is never changed in the program at all, maybe because it's it changed by the device driver, for example, right? By the, the device, but the hyper hardware device. So the compiler says, okay, I don't even need this variable, right? So it's optimization but like this. Since, since the compiler does not think it will change, but actually it is changed. So that, that will make the program wrong. Yeah, that's correct. So that's very easy to like end up with a program which is incorrect. Right. And there are a ton of them. Like that's so people what who can we do. So what can we do? You have to carefully use those uh, use those volatiles. Okay. Uh, so, it, so, so, as a it's no, it's a it's a directive to the compiler to do not optimize out the variable, oh. and and do not optimize around the fact that around the like analysis of the data flow inside the program, saying that this variable never gets changed. It is, to my understanding, that a volatile is the most overused uh, keyword for C. Uh, well, I say most like only when you program against hardware or when you program multi-threaded things, but without it, everything seems to be fine. But okay, hold on, Let, let's come back to this. So, okay, so on the poll, right? So we agree that it will run. So what's not ideal about this design is the following. So if communication is rare, uh, which means that, you know, you only occasionally uh, send something, the receiver will be spinning here in this loop wasting its own time cycles, right? So doing nothing, right? And more meaningful design choice at this point would be something like, okay, let's release the CPU and let the other program run. So kind of like say, maybe like put some kind of a yield primitive here, which goes into the operating system and says, okay, I, I'm done running. I, I don't need my time slice. I will just like, whatever, let, let's run something else, right? Okay, so let's see how it will work. Let me just quickly disable the poll. So by now, hopefully everyone actually agreed that it's the last choice. Uh, where is it? So what is that? Oh yeah, everyone changed the answer stage, which is good. Uh, disable it here, okay, disable. So, okay, cool. So what is that we wanna do with this? So we say, look, we will introduce this sleep primitive. A slip primitive says, okay, I, I don't want to run until someone changes this variable or wakes me up, right? Or like essentially say, okay, instead of spinning, let's just simply say there will be a notion of a channel, maybe it's some number or something, right? So we'll introduce it later in a second. And there will be a notion of a wake up primitive, right? And you say, look, uh, when the, the process calls sleep, the operating system puts the, like, the process into like, in a state in which it will not be scheduled again until it's woken up and it will release the CPU to other processes, right? So it kind of makes sense. And something else will start running and hopefully this something else will start uh, doing some useful work and it will eventually wake up this sleeping process, right? So with the wake up function, right? So you say, okay, look, I we're gonna do something like this, right? So here we say, we check the pointer and uh, if it's zero, we're gonna go to sleep, right? And we're gonna hope that uh, the sender will actually wake us up later, right? Does it make sense? Um, imagine sleep is a like implemented as a system call. You go into the kernel, yeah. and Yeah. 
and it, it will not monitor the channel. It will just uh, schedule the other process. This may be the other threat, T1. This one is T2. And at some point, T1 will execute, will send, will enter the kernel with a wake up system call, and the wake up will say, okay, you can, T2 can run again. Okay, so it's not that T2 will eventually wake up after the Right. So not instantly, but in the next time slice, it will be back back into the runnable state in the scheduler, and the scheduler will. Be... It will not be. Yeah, it might not be definitely the next process. It depends on the implementation of operating system, and some operating systems did implement this mechanism to kind of like, you can even donate your own time slice to say you run because I'm so good and I know that I need you. So there is this as well. But uh, okay, there was a different question, right? Or yeah, not? Okay, so do you think this code uh, is correct? Why? The situation when the the send uh, uh, call the wake up, and at that time the yeah the, the receive does not start. That means uh, even you have a wake up signal, but uh, no one. Yeah, it's kind of like waste. Or yeah, I agree. So it's called the lost wake up problem, right? Let's take a look. So no, you're absolutely correct. So this is the illustration. So the receiver goes and uh, uh, checks, reaches the line to 15. So this one checks that the, there is nothing in the queue. Uh, but at this point, maybe it either gets slow or maybe it's preempted with a context switch. At this point, the sender reaches the line to a six, like essentially says, okay, I will place something in a queue because queue was empty. I place something in a queue, immediately sends the wake up here, right? So the wake up is issued. It like propagates across the entire system, but no one is sleeping yet because this guy did not implement, did not enter the sleep state yet, right? And so it essentially doesn't do anything. Then this guy wakes up, goes to sleep, but it will be, waiting forever because no one will be there to wake it up, right? And in fact, the next receive function will reach, let's say reach, sorry, reach this line and sees that the queue is not empty. So it will be spinning here forever. We'll never issue another wake up, right? Probably. Uh, that's, I mean, a great strategy might work. And I don't know really the answer because at this point I have to reason about this protocol, which, uh, which intuitively feels possible, but I cannot definitely tell you whether it will work or not. But probably, yes, you can. It feels that you can fix this problem that if someone went to sleep, you can like just randomly wake up just to check if someone is just waiting, right? Uh, so it seems to work, but uh, maybe not the optimal strategy because again, like kind of probabilistic game here. So, and sometimes you're just wasting resources, but you don't have to do it, right? So in this case, it's deadlock. Yeah, it's, it's a deadlock. So what's the what's the better way to fix it? Just surround it with locks. Just surround it with lock, right? So you say, look, uh, like, I mean, I, I don't know if you meant exactly this, but we're gonna put a lock here, lock here, uh, look here, look here. Does it work? No. Why? Still, for example, as I said, when, when the send to everything finish, but the receive even does not start, that also means the wake up information. Oh, hold on. There's a different problem here. So imagine we acquire this lock here, and then we go to sleep meaning we're sleeping with this lock. So how do you even consent, right? Because no. this lock is already acquired, oh, right? Agree? Is that what you meant? That was your idea? But it doesn't work, right? Because you're gonna be... Everyone gets the problem with this code. You first acquire the lock, you go into sleep. You sleep with the lock acquired. Receiver comes in, says, okay, look, but the lock is acquired. I cannot even like send anything and wake up anything up. Yeah. So what's the solution?
there is this, oh, there's an idea. Correct. So what you suggest, I believe, is the following. What if we what if we pass this lock inside the sleep, right? Somehow magically. Oh. And internally we go to sleep and then release this lock, right? And this is exactly what the operating system is doing. It's a little bit tricky for how to implement this pattern, but then it works, right? So let's take a look at how. So the way to, to do it is to actually rely on a yet another lock. And it's a like kind of a two-step process. So when you go to sleep here inside the kernel, or like or inside your runtime, but I, I, I talk in terms of kernel, you acquire yet another lock. There is a another process table, p table lock, which controls all operations on processes, right? For example, the wake up will also be guarded by this lock, right? So you first acquire this p table lock. And then in the next line, you release the lock which someone passes to you, right? Means that. And the question is like, why is it safe? Why is it safe to release this lock? What, what will happen if immediately someone tries to wake me up? The safety comes from the argument that you already acquired the p-table lock, right? And so what happens internally is the following. So the wake up function, before even like proceeding to wake up, right? It will check, it will have to acquire the wake up, the p-table lock, right? So it's guarded by this lock. So the wake up will wait until you finish sleeping, right? And after that, you wake up and wake up works like you figure out the process in a sleeping state. And if it slips on this channel, you just like say this one is run up, right? Does it make sense? So, and this is an example where you have to acquire these two locks, P table lock and LK in order. So like this is one example of those like static case in which A and B locks have to be acquired in order, right? Does it make sense? So this pattern, and this pattern really is really implemented in uh, in X with six. So this is X with six code. So for example, my my communication channel, which I was describing, is very similar to a pipe. So it literally like uh, when you write into a pipe, uh, you say, okay, well, I will put something in in a buffer, and if another process was wait, waiting on this buffer data to arrive, was sleeping on this pipe, it will be woken up, right? So this pattern is really used in practice, right? Uh, and um, that's why it's kind of important. And here, so like, this is the sleep. So you acquire those locks, then you go to a scheduler and context switch to another process here. Question. So the whole time this process is sleeping, it's really Great question. And we had it on Piazza. I think it was from you, right? So no. And that's another trick which operating system is, is doing is that uh, it will actually uh, release the lock inside the scheduler. And uh, I will leave, leave it uh, the book. When you carefully read the book, it asks the same question. So what happens to the speed table lock? And it will be released, right? Mm -hmm. And so here you have to actually uh, reacquire uh, the lock again, right? Okay, so it's a little it's a little tricky, and I, I suggest uh, maybe I will assign it as a as a quiz uh, at the end of the week to essentially assign assign to come up with an explanation for how this works, how when the p table lock is actually released. Okay, because then yeah, but without it, maybe understanding is incomplete. Okay, all good. So we're done with synchronization, actually. So this is fine. So any questions about it? We'll start uh, our second part, like brief introduction to file systems. Any questions? Right, all right. Uh, there is a, I will assign reading to, to talk like there's a different like I cover one synchronization primitive. If you understand how one works, you almost instantly understand how to build others, right? Mm -hmm. So I used to have a homework uh, which asks you to build a simple spin lock, build threads in user level, observe that they are not atomic, run them in parallel on real hardware, see that the variable gets out of sync, then build locks, ensure like build a simple spin lock by literally copying this code, which we just discussed without, without just interrupt disabling into user level. 
making sure that, okay, cool, logs work. And then I was asking how to build semaphores and mutexes. And um, it's probably, I said, okay, maybe it's not my job to explain those, all the people like to know what these are. But in the past, semaphores and mutexes were used kind of more frequently. Today, the shift, uh, like importance of those synchroniza synchronization primitives kind of diminished because that uh, today, it okay, it turns out that it's hard to scale logs. In the end, they become bottlenecks. And today, people started saying, okay, can we build special synchronization primitives which are called log-free, meaning that you never acquire a log, but still execution is serializable, meaning that you can reorder updates in such a manner that it, like, they are done on a single CPU. And so it's it's a very exciting topic. You need to be an expert. I understand a little bit. Uh, I built a couple, but uh, naive ones. Probably it's part of the algorithms class. But uh, for mutexes and semaphores, since probably you will be asked from the interviews, I will assign a reading from this uh, operating system in three easy steps book, which explains what these are. So it's they are not super hard. They're like super easy, in fact. Uh, okay, any other questions? Okay, done with this. Let's do, let's quickly start the file systems. Uh, new lecture, last piece of the kernel, which we never really covered yet. Uh, oops, man. This one. Uh, okay, so just to warm up. So, why do you think we need a file system? What does it do? Stores files. Stores files. Yeah. What are those files? Disk. Huh? Disk. On disk, right? So you have a disk. Disk is kind of like uh, like DRAM. Just you can address it in not in terms of bytes, but in terms of blocks. And each block is typically like 512 bytes. So you can read 512, write 512. That's about it, right? That's a modern disk. Uh, it's a spinning disk, but I can draw here. Uh, PCI touched disk, which is called NVMe, right? What's PCI, uh, a bus which connects to the disk to the to like to the CPU, right? And this has flash here, right? So that's that's about it. It's flash, right? So okay, we got the point. So uh, the disk is more or less like DRAM. Just you cannot read bytes; you have to read blocks of five twelve bytes, right? What is a file system? We we saw the file systems. They they kind of look like there is a root folder. There are some other main, folders like main. user bin. So you're right. So we want file system to give us names for humans, right? Lines. Rights, permissions, Lines. right? To isolate users. What else? Uh, and files, like, why do we need files to begin with? Because otherwise, you would end up writing the program, which literally says, read me block number 77 and 99, because they contain my data, right? And here you say, look, I'm reading a file, alas, uh, being alas, it's an L file. The file system knows somehow that it contains, is contained in block 77 and 99, and just abstracts this away from you. So you don't even know about it. You just say, I'm going to sequentially read LS. And the fact that this one goes to 77, this one goes to 99, and this one goes to, I don't know, one or three is hidden from you. So it's very convenient, right? But uh, and this notion of a continuous file is, I will explain it in a second, but it's something what is called an inode. And it's file without a name. And then this naming layer gives one or multiple names to this inode, right? So it may be known as ls inside the bin folder, but maybe inside uh, home, there will be another name, FFF, which points to the same inode. So it's like a symbolic link in the file system, right? So okay, we understand this kind of uh, ergonomics of a file system, but what else do we need to, like what else the file system needs to implement? like a couple of other properties which are equally important or the less visible to a human. Concurrency. Concurrency, what does it mean? Yeah. 
Correct. So instead of like, uh, it, it's typically called synchronization. So it's similar to this, uh, to this locks, which we just implemented. You say, look, if, if multiple processes try to access the same file, especially write or maybe delete it, right? Or create a new folder. So you somehow need to synchronize. Otherwise, you know, you might uh, end up with a file system which is broken, like meaning that even the file system driver cannot read it anymore because it's confused about its own, its, its layout, right? So you need, you need to implement the synchronization. And what else? A couple, two more, looking for two more properties which are equally important. Metadata, uh, well, permissions we already have. So there is a couple of things here. So one is that uh, actually the file system is kind of slowish, right? So this day, these days, like back in the days when you have spinning disk, if you access memory, it's roughly 200 cycles. When you access a disk, it's 20 million cycles. So that's a lot. Right, so imagine it's like you. We've seen small programs. They sometimes can be can do some useful work in hundred cycles. You can actually send a network packet in hundred cycles, which is amazing, right? But here you have twenty million cycles to just read one block, right? So just do this round trip to disk. So logically, anyone will tell you, okay, guys, we have to cache this. So for some blocks which we access frequently, we're going to bring them to memory and we'll keep them in a memory cache, which is called the buffer cache for as long as we access this block, right? It makes sense, right? Because it will optimize us whatever, like uh, 10,000 times or 100, 100, 100 times faster, right? So we need those optimizations. So obviously this number changed with NVMe and instead of like, maybe like instead of 20 million cycles, we're roughly in like in a 10,000 cycles, but still it's kind of a little bit slowish, right? So one would, one would, one would still cache 200 cycles versus 10,000 is still, is still a lot. And uh, the uh, other thing, which is interesting and is hard and kind of hard to guess from my original diagram, but imagine, imagine you're like creating a, a new file. And when you create a new file, while intuitively it may not uh, look this way, in practice, you have to touch the file system in multiple places. You have to maybe add something to a new to a root folder because maybe you're adding a new directory to a new folder like XXX, right? Uh, and then you say, look, uh, like clearly maybe you touch this block and this block and this block because this contains metadata, this contains the content of the root folder, and this might be like some kind of block allocator, right? And you say, look, I have to really either, uh, my update has to be atomic. So again, it's kind of similar to the synchronization. So either all these three writes have to go through or none at all, because if you let two of them go through, the file system thinks that XSX, XXX is there in a file system, but uh, the actual content of XSX, XXX will not be present, right? And you say, look, that's not okay, right? So you need this atomicity, you need this transaction, right? And the file system will implement this primitive for you where it's literally like a database transaction to make sure that either three of them happen or none of them happen at all, right? So this is the properties and this is what file system actually implements, right? And we got that ergonomics like uh, human readability, the naming layer, that's kind of intuitively uh, clear. These transactions are less clear and it's not clear how to build them. So I will explain how they are done, right? Okay, so, but more or less, let me just recap what we just said. The ideas are the following. So we have uh, like essentially a mechanism which allows us to share data between multiple processors and processes and between multiple users, right? So those are files. They actually implement persistent storage so you can power off the machine. Uh, and uh, like next time you reboot, the data will be there. That's convenient. That's on the disk. Uh, the file system itself is a combination of on disk and in memory data structure. So in memory, uh, implement those caching, synchronization, transactional layers, right? And on disk implements persistent when you switch off the power, memory disappears, right? So, and uh, then you can come back later. So crash recovery, I just explained, and we need caching for speed, right? And at a high level, most modern file systems, uh, let's say conventional file system, maybe like now we have different optimizations, they are implemented as those layers, right? So, and we will cover those layers next time one by one, but at the 
the bottommost level is called a buffer cache. So essentially, it uh, really communicates with the disk and reads individual blocks from disk, right? And it actually caches them in memory, saying that, okay, I will remember I will remember that this block was uh, read in memory, so you don't have to read it from disk again. And it also implements synchronization for the upper layer. So it says, okay, if someone tries to read or write this block, uh, there will be like a protocol, which is somewhat similar to synchronization cache coherence protocol, which will be implementing this requests for ownership of, on this block, right? So it's this layer is called the buffer cache in X 6 and in many other systems as well. Above this, there is a next layer, which implements the atomicity. So it will allow you to group multiple writes into a single transaction. And the reason not all writes can go through, right? So you say, look, uh, I, I intend to write three writes, right? But you wrote two and suddenly lost power here, right? The third is lost just because machine rebooted, for example, right? Uh, above this level, there is, will be a level of inodes. And these inodes are essentially unnamed files. Like I was saying, they don't have a human readable name, just an ID like five, right? About this, there will be a directory level which implements essentially mapping between the uh, inode numbers to human readable uh, human readable names, right? And about this, there will be a layer which resolves, passes, essentially like each of this will be a different directory, right? Kept in a different inode. And this pass name will essentially, you pass this as a string, it will parse individual parts of it and just essentially resolve user in like finding a pointer to bin, pointer to SH, and then essentially will return you an inode to SH. So it resolves uh, names into inode pointers. And above this, there will be a layer of system calls, uh, which we've seen before, which like open, read, write, stuff like that, right? And so we're gonna like explain them I quickly cover them one by one each time. So question. Okay. Good. So okay, a high level overview is kind of clear, right? So next time we're gonna start with an actual layout of the file system on disk. So we understand how everything is implemented and hopefully we'll finish the file system there. So thank you. I will see you on Thursday.